Can you guys hear me? Okay. Can you still hear me if I walk over here? Perfect. All right. I'm going to try to do this mostly from outside of the podium. It's just a little bit more informal. Um, my name is Ben Roan. I, um, I'm a partner in the corporate practice group at Brown Rudnick. Uh, I have, I'm happy to be here in what is I, my fifth or sixth year, I think, uh, presenting at Startup Boston Week. Uh, and it's a phenomenal event. Um, and so for those of you who haven't been here before, you're in for a real treat this week. Um, I'm here to talk about one of the most important relationships that you will develop or you'll need to develop to become a successful entrepreneur. And that is, of course, the relationship with your lawyer. Now, um, that may sound self-serving, but if you grow it, uh, if you grow a business, what, is it a little on the left? I'm going to try holding it a little farther down. I'm getting okay. a little audio back. Um, if you grow a successful business, you are going to end up spending a lot of time talking to your company's counsel, and you're going to end up spending a lot of money on legal fees. So it's not an exaggeration to say that it is actually a very important relationship. My goal today is to help you better understand the dynamics of that relationship so that you can have a more productive working relationship and ultimately, um, hopefully, will lead to a more successful company in some small, small respect. Since I'm going to be talking about the importance of finding a lawyer and relevant experience and expertise, it seems only fair that I tell you a little bit of my own experience and expertise. Um, first of all, I am a lawyer, um, so uh, that's helpful, I think, for this. I've been working with startups and early stage technology companies, um, founders, for 20 years now. Uh, I've worked with the up. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Two. Okay. All right. Apparently, I wasn't being hurt. Um, I've been working with, uh, with early stage companies for 20 years now, helping uh, founders launch and grow businesses. Um, and I've worked both at large firms and uh, for a couple of years, I ran a two-person or I was half of a two-person law firm in, in Boston called VC Ready Law Group. So I've seen a lot of different, I have a lot of different perspectives on the relationship between lawyers and founders um, from both a large and small firm perspective uh, and it co with companies at various stages in their life cycle. The first thing you should know about lawyers is that um, their advice almost always comes with a disclaimer. So um, lawyers give advice most of the time that sounds something like, if A, B, and C are true, then it's likely that D will happen. Did we just? Okay. Um, whoever's controlling the video, it just switched to the video instead of my slide. So if you can switch that back, I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> um, so this highlights a couple of uh, important aspects of the attorney client relationship. One is, Law isn't black and white, notwithstanding the fact that we'd like everything to have clear answers to it. A lot of law is a gray area. And that means that a lot of times I can't give you the answer to do something or not do something. What I can do is tell you these are the risks involved in doing it um, and give you some guidance as to what I think maybe you should do or what kinds of things might be. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, what kind of things might be typical in a given situation? The second aspect of it is, I'm not the one who makes the decisions. Ultimately, if you were starting a company, you were doing something inherently risky, and you were the one who gets to make the decisions about what risks you want to take. My, my job is to basically help you understand what those risks are so you can make an informed decision. So the presentation is divided into five topics. We're going to start by talking about keys to understanding the attorney-client relationship. Then we'll talk a little bit about finding and retaining a lawyer, what you need, how you need to find a lawyer, how you go about finding a lawyer, when you need a lawyer, the terms of engagement with a lawyer. We'll talk about working with a lawyer, the day-to-day -day process, communication, staffing, emergency situations, billing and budgets. What everybody wants to know is how can I spend less money on legal fees? 
and then briefly talk about what happens if you don't like your lawyer and you want to change lawyers. I'm going to do my best to make it to the end of this and still have some time for questions. Um, but we do have a lot to cover. So if you would, please just hold your questions till the end, if you can, unless I say something completely outrageous. And then um, to the extent that I'm not, that we run out of time, I will be able to stick around afterwards to answer questions um, in the hall if anybody has them. Fair enough. So to work effectively with lawyers, um, it's helpful to understand a few things. First, the client is the company, not the individual entrepreneur. Now, this is a little counterintuitive sometimes. Lawyers will refer to the CEO of the, of the company as the client all the time. But the client is actually the company. The engagement is between usually the law firm and the business. So that means the attorney's obligations are to the company, not the individual founder or CEO. And the company is ultimately controlled by the board. Now, at the earliest stages of the company, there's not much of a distinction between the founder, the management, and the board, or even the stockholders. They're usually basically all one and the same. But as your company grows, and particularly when you start bringing in investors who have different interests than yours, you, you broaden out the board, um, you will come to a point where you are no longer, if you are the founder, you are no longer wholly in control of everything. And there may come a point where there's a disagreement between the CEO, you, and the board members of the company. And when that happens, it's important for you as a founder to understand that the attorney answers to the board, not to you. And it may be appropriate for you in that situation to go out and find your own counsel so that you can be advised by your own attorney with respect to what's going on with the board. The second thing you should understand is that lawyers usually do not have an equity stake in their clients. Some lawyers will work for equity. By and large, we don't. And there's a reason for that. It creates a little bit of a conflict of interest if I own equity in the clients that I represent. If you Imagine, if you will, that we're negotiating an exit for you. We're negotiating a sale transaction. And there's an issue that pops up that you ask me about. And I think to myself, geez, if this deal goes through, I stand to make a decent amount of money because of the equity I have in the company. So maybe I downplay the significance of the issue. That's one of the reasons why for the most part, lawyers do not take equity in their clients. There are exceptions, but you have to be aware if your lawyer has an equity interest in your company that they're their interests are misaligned with yours when it comes to their uh, what they do for a living. Now, this puts them in a different position than pretty much anybody else that works for you because equity in a company is one of the most valuable currencies that a startup has to pay people with. They don't generally have a lot of cash. So you use equity to pay your advisors, use equity to pay employees, use equity to pay darn near everybody but most of the time not your lawyer, because your lawyer is the one person you should be able to go to and say, what do I do here? And they should be able to give you an answer that has nothing to do with their own self-interest as far as the future of the company is concerned. Now, having told you that, I'm gonna tell you that the flip side of that is the is that there is a potential problem with fees, right? So. Nothing prohibits a, a, a client from terminating the attorney-client relationship at any time for any reason. There is a benefit to this. The client doesn't want to be stuck in a bad relationship with a lawyer. This incentivizes lawyers to diversify their client base. This incentivizes client, this allows clients to feel free to go wherever they want to. But because you have the ability to leave the relationship at any time, the lawyer has a much more vested interest in the short term uh, and making sure that you are paying them on a short term basis uh, in case they lose that relationship. Right. So. And we'll talk about this. We'll talk about this in a minute. One of the problems that you, that you can run into 
uh, in a relationship between a lawyer and startup company is where the lawyer allows or the company allows fees to accrue until, to the point where they are material, right? Where you defer the fees or you simply don't pay the fees. And at some point, there becomes a tension between the lawyer wanting to make sure they're getting paid on the money that's owed versus, uh, you know, basically the long-term relationship, um, maintaining the long-term relationship. The final thing I want to point out is that, as I mentioned earlier, lawyers advise on risks. They don't make decisions. Um, if something comes up, I will tell you what the issues are and how you need to evaluate them, but I'm not going to ultimately make the decision for you about whether or not you need to do something. You're, if you are an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, you're doing something inherently risky. All of you who are starting companies could be doing something that is less risky and at least in the short term, more lucrative than starting a company. For example, you could probably go become a lawyer. So it's not my place to tell you, you can't take this risk. My job is to tell you, these are the risks. These are potential consequences. You get to make the decision about whether or not that's a risk you're willing to take. So there are a couple things that, uh, a couple kind of events in your, in the company's life cycle that should trigger you to go out and find a lawyer if you don't already have one. And it mostly fall into two categories. One is uh, you're basically in a business relationship with somebody else. And that could be a co-founder, it could be an employee, um, it could be somebody you're entering into a contract with, it could be raising capital. Anytime you are doing business of some sort with a third party, there is a potential for liability. There's potential for a dispute, which creates the potential for liability. In that case, a lawyer can help you figure out where the risks are and avoid them or mitigate them. The second place where you oftentimes want to have a lawyer is if you have some sort of valuable property you want to protect. This is particularly important for um, companies in, say, the life sciences industry, where the technology is fundamental to the business that you're building, right? The patents around that technology are the most valuable asset you're going to have, or maybe the second most valuable after the people. It's a little less significant for companies, say, in the software space, where we don't tend to uh, patent software. There's some exceptions, but for the most part, um, uh, code is protected effectively by just either trade secrets or the simple fact that somebody else is going to have to go to the trouble of rebuilding it. But there's not a lot of hard intellectual property there that you're looking to protect. The most valuable asset you have if you're a startup tech company is usually the people working for the business, right? So in those two instances, it's usually a good idea if you don't have one already to go out and find a lawyer. Once you're actually out looking for a lawyer, there are a few things you should, you should be thinking about. Now, law is a different, um, finding a lawyer is a little different than finding another professional. If you feel sick and you go to your doctor and your doctor gives you a pill, you go home, you take the pill, you feel better you can be pretty certain that the pill helped you, or at least it didn't hurt you. Law isn't like that. You may never find out whether the contract that your lawyer gave you was well-written or not. Because the only time you ever find out if something's a problem is if there's a dispute with the other party. Right? And because of that, it's very hard to tell the value of a lawyer without secondary criteria, secondary indicators of value. And the best one by far is referrals. Referrals from people you know are helpful. Referrals from people in the same space is much more helpful. If you are a founder, go to other founders, talk to them about who they like, 
using, what the pros and cons are, what they're looking for in a lawyer. Subject matter expertise of the lawyer, subject matter expertise and experience is absolutely critical. If you're starting a company, you want to hire a lawyer who has experience helping companies get off the ground because there are a lot of aspects of the relationship that are particular to that particular stage in a company's business. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about them in a second. But what you don't want to end up with is a situation where you're working with somebody who is not familiar with the struggles that a startup faces, and in particular not, not, not familiar with the cash crunch that comes oftentimes with being an early stage company. Slightly lower down on the list is the lawyer's industry expertise, experience, and relationships. Those are valuable, but also something that, unless you're in an industry, say, like uh, life sciences, where you might need particular technical expertise, oil and gas, where there's a lot of regulations, um, unless you're in a highly regulated area like that or an area with, where the expertise is very specific, you don't necessarily need a lawyer that is... Um, that has a particular knowledge of your industry. You can find somebody who practices generally in tech, right? For example, a third aspect is personal chemistry. I like to refer to sort of the 4 a.m. test, which is you want to make sure your lawyer is going to pick up your call at 4 a.m. if you need them to, maybe 5 a.m. My, my best worst story on this is about seven years ago, I closed a deal for a client, a financing deal for a client, uh, the day before I left on vacation. And my wife and I flew to Italy, and 24 hours, hour, 24 hours later, I'm in Rome, and I get a phone call from the client. <clears throat> now, before I left, the client had very nicely said to me, have a nice vacation, thank you very much, won't talk to you until you get back. So I'm a little nervous about this, but I let it go to voicemail. So then I get a voicemail and then I get a text and then I think, okay, something's wrong. I spent about two hours that evening and probably in excess of 10 hours that week in various parts of Italy, uh, talking to the CEO and the board about what was going on. Um, and that's work I could theoretically have delegated to somebody, but I knew it wouldn't have reflected particularly well on my commitment to that company if at the time that they were in trouble, I told I passed them off to somebody else, notwithstanding the fact that I was on vacation. It's hard to judge that before you enter into a relationship with a lawyer, but the referrals will help, right? Talking to other people will help you to get a sense of how committed the person is to what you're doing. You also want to actually talk to the lawyer, sit down and have coffee with them, right? Talk to them about how they operate, how they work with startups, ask them questions, to try to develop a little bit of rapport like you would with anybody else because you will be spending a lot of time and, and hiring a lawyer is a commitment. You can get out of it, but it's a commitment. Next on the list is rates and fee structure. Now you want, might be wondering why is this so far down on the list? And the answer is that rates and fee structure, if you've got the right attorney, are somewhat malleable. <clears throat> Whether, if you're going with a, a solo lawyer or a small firm, um, you're going to find lower rates typically and less flexibility on payments. When me and my partner were at were part of a two-person law firm. Getting paid every month was essential because we were using that money to pay our bills. At a larger firm, you might have you'll have larger fees, you'll have higher rates, but the firms usually have a lot more flexibility as to um, how they bill, when they bill, discounts, deferrals, stuff like that. So there's a trade-off, and ultimately. There's not necessarily a right answer. If your company is growing quickly, a large firm may be advantageous because you're going to need a lot of expertise and it may be beneficial to have a one-stop shop uh, 
even if it costs you more money. But it's hard to say. Again, the important thing is to find a lawyer that you trust and like working with because they will help you manage it whether it is within their firm or whether it is with other firms. Last on the list is relevant expertise and experience to the other partners at the law firm. <clears throat> um, again, if you're going to a larger firm, that can be incredibly important uh, for particular sectors and uh, particular sectors like life sciences, like uh, oil and gas, maybe like crypto AI. I, ultimately, most large firms are going to have the expertise that you're looking for. So the particular firm may not be as important as making sure that uh, the primary relationship you have with the lawyer is a good one because they will help you find the right people within their organization, within another organization. The, sorry, I lost my place. Um, the fee arrangement, payment terms, and other basic details of the attorney-client relationship will be spelled out we spell out an engagement letter. Um, the engagement letter will list out the hourly rates of the attorneys or the primary attorney, as well as usually a range of the attorneys that might be working on the work, or at least the range of the attorneys at the firm. If there are any um, specific arrangements around deferrals or, or uh, uh, or caps or fixed fees, that'll also be uh, outlined in the engagement letter as, all, as well. Now, there's a couple of different ways in which lawyers can bill you. The typical one is just hourly rates. Hourly rates are pretty straightforward. Uh, certain number of hours multiplied by the billable rate ends with the gross rate. Nobody likes hourly billing, least of all your lawyer but it exists for a reason. It used to be back in the day that lawyer would simply do the work, send a bill, services rendered $100. Over time, what happened is clients started pushing back and saying, well, what did you do for that $100? So lawyers started saying, okay, well, I'll, I'll write out what I wrote, what I did for that amount of time. And then you get to, well, did that really take you? How much time did it take you? Why am I paying you $100 if it only took you five minutes? Didn't you do the same thing for somebody else last week? Why is, why is it taking you so long to do it again? So the result is hourly billing. And while it's an imperfect system, it is by and large the norm. Now, I'm happy to get into a sidebar at some point about what AI is going to do to uh, the way lawyers bill work. Uh, that's a whole other topic. And there is talk in the legal industry about ways in which billing is going to have to change. But for the moment, you should expect that most work is done on an hourly basis. However, there are things that can be done on a fixed or cap fee basis. <clears throat> now, personally, I'm usually willing to try and fix a fee. I rarely will cap a fee. And the reason so you understand it is Capping fees is sort of heads you win, head, tails I lose. Because in cap fee scenario, we bill out at an hourly rate. If the project ends up being below the cap, you pay the hourly rate. If it ends up being above the cap, you end up paying the cap. But either way, you pay the lower amount. Okay? That doesn't provide me with any upside for the risk I'm taking by capping the fee. Fixing the fee, on the other hand, works. Because I can fix a fee, building in some buffer for the amount of time I think the work might take. And if we can come to an agreement, then that works for me. There's a little bit of downside, a little bit of upside. The tricky part is fixing fees on complicated transactions requires allowing a lot more buffer and therefore much higher fixed fee than you might get if the at an hourly rate if the transaction goes smoothly. So imagine, if you will, uh, two different scenarios. If I'm simply incorporating a company, 
I don't have to deal with another lawyer. I'm simply dealing with the entrepreneur. I know the work involved. I've got the documents. I can tell you I'll fix the fee at X because I know that even if we end up spending three hours on the phone talking about all the terms, it's not going to cost, it's not going to take me more than, you know, four or five hours to do. That's very different from a scenario where we're negotiating, for example, a financing with an investor or a couple of investors, and they've got another law firm, and I can't control the other law firm or the other client, the, the other party. In that scenario, I have to build in a much bigger buffer because while I might say typically the project will take 20 hours, it could take 50 or more. So for those reasons, fixed fees are not always a great uh, alternative to the hourly billing rate. They can be, but you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. And you have to understand that the hourly rate might end up being lower than the fixed fee. Discounts and deferrals are things that um, a lot of lawyers in this space, particularly at large firms, will use to help uh, basically help their companies at the earliest stages. <clears throat> Discounts are simply taking money off the top. Deferrals are you can pay me later, right? Um, this is the way in which large firms try to reduce the effective rate on their startup company clients, even though they're billing their larger company clients at a, at a much higher billing rate. You should absolutely ask about discounts and deferrals when you're talking to potential counsel and find out what their policies are and whether they're able to do it or they're able to put it into, a, into your engagement letter. Discounts, in my experience, are pretty common, at least for a period of time. Usually from inception to the time you raise a certain amount of money, law firms are pretty willing to offer discounts off their, their what's called rack rates, their typical hourly rate, to give you a chance to get to um, uh, raise capital so you can pay their, their normal rates. Deferrals are less common and typically reserved for situations where there is a um, some sort of relationship, either pre-existing relationship with a lawyer or referral in from a third party. So for example, if you were connected to your lawyer through an investor that you are working with, you're much more likely to get a deferral deal than if you're just coming in off, like coming in cold and talking to the lawyer. Because from the law, law excuse me, from the lawyer's perspective, uh, that deferral is a risk. It's an investment that you're making in the entrepreneur and in the business. And if I was any good at evaluating whether or not a business was going to be successful, I'd be a venture capitalist. <laughs> so. I'm taking a risk without the same kind of upside reward that another investor gets because ultimately the only thing I'm getting back at the end of the deferral is the amount of money I was supposed to get in the first place. Effectively, I'm losing the time value of that money. So deferrals are situations where deferrals are put in place in situations where um, there's usually a, uh, an additional incentive. It's additional incentive to come and work with the law firm. Um, sorry. Most law, most law firms, um, payment terms for most law firms are either immediately or net 30. Um, sometimes you can, uh, negotiate longer payment terms, but lawyers generally expect to be paid pretty promptly again, absent, uh, deferrals. And lawyers usually are looking for retainers of some sort from their startup company clients. That's not usually a large amount of money, but it might be a large amount of money for you, right? Typically, our retainers right now are around $5,000. We will cut it below that in certain circumstances. Again, depends on the circumstances. Uh, referrals help. But it's $5,000 because most of the time you're going to run through that $5,000 pretty quickly even in just incorporating the company. Uh, retainers usually get used up immediately. 
but sometimes we'll ask for retainers that we can hold on to for purposes of continuing to advance fees, for example, advance expenses on your behalf for things like filing fees. When you get an engagement letter from a law firm, please read it. It's boring, it's long, they're, they're usually five to 10 pages, they go through a lot of obnoxious stuff, a lot of details, a lot of it you, your eyes will just glaze over, but please read it. Because there are some important details in there about the way in which the firm is gonna pay you. First of all, just the hourly rates, the payment terms, if there's gonna be any sort of payment deferral or discount, the way in which the law firm is gonna pass through third party expenses, et cetera. Read it, try to understand it, ask the lawyer if you have questions about it, um, make sure it's accurate. Oops, can't do that. All right. So once you've hired a lawyer, the most important thing you can do to maintain a productive working relationship is to keep your lawyer in the loop about developments with your business and your plans for the future. Keeping your lawyer informed will allow him or her to help you avoid the pitfalls uh, and facilitate proper staffing of work to help make the work more cost effective for you. Both of those things will save you money. Personally, I consider time spent just catching up with my clients to be off the clock. It's a business development expense. If you call me and say, I just want to bounce something off you, that's time that I'm basically spending to get the work that will come out of it. We bill you for the legal work. It's not the policy at all, all firms, and it also won't necessarily be the policy when you are a, you know, when you've raised a billion dollars, okay? At some point, the kid gloves come off, right? But at the early stages, I'm making an investment in your growth because I'm interested in the long-term relationship, right? From my perspective, the short-term payments aren't what move the needle. I wanna be there as your company grows. I wanna be there as uh, when you eventually uh, raise capital, do large transactions, buy companies, sell companies, go public. So I'm more than willing to put in that, uh, that front end uh, um, business development time to make sure that we have a, a good relationship and to make sure that I understand what's going on at your business so that I can help you through those early stages and, and overcome the pitfalls uh, that you're gonna run into. It is always easier to avoid problems than fixing them down the road. One of the reasons I, I started not charging clients in the early stages for, uh, for my time is, or for, my, for talking to me is because I had problems when I was earlier in my career with founders that would call me up with an emergency and they'd say, we have to get this done ASAP. It's, you know, at the 11th hour and now it's, now it needs to be done urgently. And I'd say, well, why didn't you tell me about this three weeks ago? And they'd say, well, I knew if I called you up, it was going to cost me a bunch of money. And I didn't know if the, this was going to go through. I didn't know it was going to happen. And I didn't want to spend the money if the deal wasn't going to go through. Well, now I'm in a situation where I can't do much other than do the work myself. And I've got to bill you what I, I've got to bill you for the time, right? It doesn't allow me to manage the bill, manage the work in a way that will help you help reduce the bill. So please keep your lawyer in the loop. It is easier, it is cheaper to avoid problems uh, in the first place. Set up regular check-in calls. Invite your lawyer to attend board meetings, which also, by the way, a lot of lawyers, including myself, will do off the clock for periodic board meetings. Keep, send your, put your lawyer on the update list that you send to your investors. One of my favorite clients sends a monthly update to their investors that is the 
best, most informative thing I read any, every month from all of my clients because it gives me insight into where they're at that I don't get from anywhere else. And they don't, it's not a second of my, of their time with me. They're sending me the same update they're sending everybody else, right? And now I know what's going on and I'm better able to predict what they're gonna need, call them up, tell them they might need to think about something. And we don't have to spend time when they do call me catching up on what's been happening. Help your lawyer understand your business and your ongoing, so they can help you understand your ongoing legal needs, right? If you're planning on staffing up, give them a heads up, right? You can talk about the legal issues involved with hiring people, firing people. If you're looking at strategic relationships, talk to them about what you're thinking of so they can talk to you about the possible terms that you want to look out for. Keep them informed. A second aspect that's critical for the attorney-client relationship and working with lawyers is staffing. If you're at a larger firm, not all the work is going to be done by the lawyer, the principal lawyer that you have the relationship with. Over time, you will end up working with a number of lawyers at the firm for usually one of two reasons. Either A, particular subject matter expertise, intellectual property lawyers, employment lawyers, tax lawyers, or B, because there are associates at the firm that simply have a lower billing rate, and it's more cost effective for, a theory at least, for them to do the work than for me to do the work. Now, in, since we're having a transparent conversation, if my billing rate is twice what the associates is, but I'm three times more efficient, it's actually better for me to do the work from your perspective. But I have to train the associates. I have to teach them how to do the work, which means I've got to give them the work to do. So it is on me to make sure the bill gets managed in a way that doesn't end up costing you more than it would otherwise. And we'll talk about managing bills in a second. So I'll come back to that. The trick about staffing, as I mentioned a second ago, is that I have to have time to do to staff things in the appropriate way. So if you call me with an emergency, I have to staff it with whomever is available. And usually that means me. And I am the last person you want drafting board minutes at 11 o'clock at night, right? The night before your board meeting. You want the associate doing it at half the billing rate, I assure you. But if you call me the night before the board meeting and tell me this is what I need, then that's what's going to happen. So if you keep your lawyer informed, it will help them to better staff things or staff things more appropriately, which will ultimately save you money. When it comes to day-to-day -day legal work, there are a number of things that you can do to help control fees. <clears throat> work with your lawyer to prioritize the legal work. If you have a bunch of things that need to be done, your lawyer can help you prioritize the order in which they need to be done right? from a legal perspective. You may have patents that need to be filed within as soon as possible. You may have uh, an employee equity incentive plan that could probably wait a month. You might have um, contracts. You might have uh, uh, various issues that you want to make sure get done, but they don't have to be done right now. What your lawyer can do is sit there is, is basically help you identify the priorities so that you're not basically using up um, all your resources on legal bills in one month. Ensure your, you and your lawyer have a clear understanding about, about timing and deliverables. If you need something immediately, tell the lawyer you need it immediately. But don't tell them you need it immediately if you don't. Because again, if I have the time, I can staff it more appropriately. I can push stuff down to a lower billing rate. I can work with you to make sure things are done more efficiently. If you want a full-blown legal memo describing all the issues that are, that have to be addressed of, with respect to a particular um, legal topic, let me know. I'm happy to produce it. 
But if you just want a bullet point list, tell me that. We should have that conversation. Now, to some degree, that's on me to ask you, but don't be afraid to, to affirmatively say, look, I don't need a 10-page memo on this. I don't need a two-page memo on this. I just need a quick few things points that I can consider or a quick 10 minute call. Because again, what you don't want is to suddenly be paying for, or at least charged for a, a document that is not what you needed for that particular situation. Right? I've already talked about don't uh, try to avoid unnecessary rush projects. <clears throat> don't set artificial deadlines. Um, consider handling some of the administrative costs yourself if you're trying, if you're particularly cost sensitive. There are certain things that you can handle or somebody else on your staff can handle that um, you don't need to be paying me or one of my colleagues for. Uh, one classic example of these days is uh, cap table management. If you're familiar with uh, services like Carta, They've basically taken a whole bunch of stuff that lawyers used to do for their clients on Excel spreadsheets, and they've put it all onto a nice, they packaged it all nicely into a little software as a service, and uh, it's great. And while you will need your lawyer for some aspects of it, once you've got the hang of how Carta works and the type of information you want to include, you can manage Carta, a lot of Carta pretty easily. And that's a lot of time that you can save, um, or a lot of money you can save by not having your lawyer do that work. If you do have an emer God, <clears throat> if you do have an emergency, please tell your lawyer as soon as possible, because it will be much easier for me to help you through it and help you manage the costs involved if I know about it as soon as. I as uh, sooner rather than later. Don't wait and tell me again at the 11th hour. I apparently have to pick up the pace here a little bit. <clears throat> Even if you have a good working relationship with your lawyer, um, there may come a point at which you run into conflicts over the bills. So <clears throat> I want it's helpful to understand a little bit about the billing process. Attorneys and paralegals bill time typically in 10th of an hour increments. That's every six minutes. Okay. So my day is recorded on a timesheet where I'm literally going start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, okay? And then the end of the day, you add up all the time, it adds up to however many fractions of an hour, and that's the build, that's the build amount for that day. At the end of the month, the billing partner, which is usually the primary relationship partner, receives a pro forma bill. It lists out all the work that all the attorneys have done and descriptions of what they've done. They then review that bill and they will oftentimes write off or write down certain portions of the bill to the point where they think it is appropriate for the work that was done. Because ultimately, I do not want to send you a bill that you go, whoa, where did this come from? Right? That's not a good look for me. I want you to, I want you to look, there are going to be times where you're going to go, yeesh, that's a lot of money. Just being perfectly honest. But I want you to think it's commensurate with the value that you've got. So I'm going to mark down that bill, whether it's because I just think it's too high, I think somebody spent too much time, I think, you know, at this point you just need a little more runway, whatever it is, I'm going to write down that bill to a point where I think it's appropriate for the value that you've got. I'm then going to send you the bill, and then we're going to have another conversation if you want to, about whether or not you have further concerns about it. Keep in mind that write-offs and write-downs are something that I also have to clear with firm management. And so you can have a tension sometimes where the lawyer gets stuck between the client that wants a lower, lower, lower um, bill and the law firm that is saying, we won't let you reduce this bill anymore. So as much as possible, the lawyer is trying to sort of skate that line, all right? And it's helpful for you to understand that that is something, that is, a, that is a pressure on your lawyer on the other end. So when your lawyer is telling you, I can't do this, 
I, I literally am not allowed to do this. It's not because necessarily they don't want to. It may be because they are literally are not allowed to under pol their policy. It is oftentimes easier for the lawyer to give you a deferral to let you say, you know what? Just don't send me a check this month. Send it to me next month. Or to give you discounts off future work. Look, I realize you think the bill is $5,000 too high this month. I can't reduce the bill by $5,000 this month. They won't let me or buy another $5,000. But I'll give you a credit towards future work. I'm telling this because I want you to understand the dynamics and this will, what this hopefully will allow you to do is be better prepared when you are in that situation to understand what levers you can pull to make the, to, to make basically the, the relationship continue to work. Once the bill is sent, it's usually due within 30 days, uh, as we talked about earlier. Um, if there's a dispute, call the lawyer to discuss the bill. Explain to them the problem. Is it you don't have the money to pay right now? Is it that you have a particular issue with some work that somebody did? Is it that, is it something else, right? Have that discussion because that will allow you to maintain the relationship and the lawyer will, again, if you've hired somebody who is in this space, that will they will be flexible as much as they can be to, uh, to help you work something out in the benefit of the long-term relationship. Billing rates typically increase annually, usually by the, cost, the rate of inflation, sometimes a little bit more. Legal fees will grow significantly as your company grows. So I've listed out there a rough sense of fees for typical transactions. Um, it is, I can't tell you the number of times I've looked at projections, financial projections for companies that show legal fees at a constant rate for two to five years into the future. And it's usually at like $2,000 a month. It won't happen. As you grow, your legal needs will increase. And your projection should reflect that. If for no other reason so that your investor, that the investor you're presenting them to actually knows that you're thinking th seriously about the costs that you're going to incur in the future. Now, you're, the, the monthly rates won't be the same. They won't be constant. <clears throat> so where I say it might be $2,500 to $10,000 a month after you've raised capital, it's not going to be that way every month. There may still be months where you don't talk to your lawyer at all and there's no legal bill. But there will also be months where it's $30,000. So plan accordingly. <clears throat> Even if you do everything right, even if you, in, in selecting a lawyer, there may just come a point where the relationship isn't working. That happens for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's loss of trust. Your attorney's not being as responsive as they said they would be. The fees are too high. There's a dispute over the fees, whatever it might be. There's two things I want you to understand in that kind of scenario. Actually, three things. First, I've already told you, which is you are free to leave at any time. You are not tied to your lawyer or the law firm in any way. Second, transitioning services should be easy and it is largely not your responsibility. Your new law firm will do it for you. You hire a new firm, that firm gives you a form letter that you sign that says, dear old lawyer, I'm moving my work over to my new lawyer. Please send all my files. The law firms, Coordinate that, the files get transmitted these days basically entirely electronically, and that's it. The third thing is the money you owe <clears throat> um, stays on the books of the company. It is a debt of the company. And I encourage you, I implore you from a professional standpoint to pay your lawyer but they're probably not going to chase you for the money unless it's a significant amount of money. I hate to admit that, but it's true, right? Um, nobody sues a client over $10,000. Right? 
you get up into the six figures and you're going to start getting some, some phone calls, but nobody sues a client over $10,000. Right. Um, <clears throat> I would ask you if you are going to switch lawyers to call your lawyer and tell them that I have been on both sides of this. And I know ghosting is a thing these days. Please don't ghost your lawyer. <clears throat> They've put a lot of time and effort uh, into the relationship. And the startup world is a small community, right? And we're all repeat players in this space. And you never know when your paths are gonna cross again or in what context. So please be professional. And your lawyer should be professional too, right? It is a difficult thing to be fired. It's kind of like being broken up with. It's not easy, nobody likes it. But at the end of the day, we're all in the same community. We're all trying to build things together. Um, <clears throat> so, oops. that's what I have. I'm gonna put this tip, this list of tips up here. You can this just repeat some of the things I've said. Um, but in the two or three minutes that I have, I thought I'd at least entertain some questions. And I think I see one back. Do I need to give anybody a mic for this? <clears throat> yeah, raise your hand, please. Gentleman in the back. Sure. Or you can talk really loudly. No, no. He oh, wait, no, wait. You got to wait. Have a mic. You got to wait for the mic. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. I'm I'm curious, what are your thoughts about having a few different attorneys, you know, startup attorneys, some that are a little bit on the less expensive, like you said, side for the hourly that can do the easier, not as difficult things, but then the, you know, more expensive ones like Brown Rudnick that, you know, take care of things happen. I, I think that if you've got subject matter expertise issues, like if you want to hire a different patent lawyer and a different corporate lawyer, um, there may be reasons that, that that sometimes works at the earlier stages. And even sometimes as companies get larger, they may still use different law firms for specific areas of work. I think hiring three corporate generalists just because you want to send one, one set of things and one another is probably a little penny wise and pound foolish because you're not going to save that much money the larger law firm is probably going to be willing to um, cut your deal on rates for a period of time. And uh, if they're not, you can find somebody else who is. I mean, it, it just, it doesn't really, the inefficiencies involved with doing that probably outweigh the benefits. Um, and I've never seen it work because ultimately what happens is then when you go to your, if at some point, if you've had somebody else, um, uh, let's say you have a small firm or solo firm do your basic corporate governance work. And then you go to raise capital and you go to Brown Rudnick to help you raise the capital. And Brown Rudnick then identifies, I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it does happen. Brown Rudnick identifies things that were missed. Maybe because uh, the solo or small firm lawyer didn't, didn't do it correctly, but oftentimes because they just didn't know about it right? Because you've got multiple lawyers, you're talking to multiple lawyers and they don't all have the right, all the information. And so something got missed. And then you've got to redo the stuff in connection with the financing. And now you're putting your financing at risk because of some, you know, basically because you saved a couple of dollars on legal fees. So my advice is not to. Okay. Hi there. Uh, my question is, so if I'm starting a startup, uh, Prover proverbial two people in the garage, not independently wealthy, uh, how soon to engage with a lawyer, uh, self-funded, uh, you know, just how early is too early? I, yeah, I don't, I don't think there is a too early because first of all, you already have a co-founder, right? So you're already dealing with a situation where you're trying to manage a relationship with a third party in which you can have a dispute. And what claim do they have on the assets of the company? Um, I think, again, from the Pennywise found, pound foolish kind of scenario, 
um, or a book, it is better for you to find a lawyer that can help you put something together relatively inexpensively uh, to memorialize that relationship in the way that you want it memorialized. And if you need to find a law firm that will either defer the fees or fix the rate, give you some time to pay it. But you should, if you are, there are a lot of law firms in this in this city, to say nothing of the larger country, that are in this space doing this work looking for clients. You can find somebody. You've got, I assure you that if you are out there networking at Startup Boston Week or elsewhere, you can make a connection with someone who will refer you to a lawyer who will give you some sort of deal on that kind of stuff. Oftentimes that kind of work can be done at a fixed rate because I'm not negotiating with a whole bunch of different people, right? So I understand it's still costly, but it shouldn't be cost prohibitive. Fair enough. Although we lost our virtual folks over there, we okay. still have some time uh, here in this room, okay. so we can maybe okay. take a couple more questions. Sorry, I didn't get sent you had one, right? Virtual folks. Thank you. This has been very helpful. Um, my question is: Like, uh, are there any other red flags uh, in the selection process uh, for working with a lawyer? Um, resisting the urge to tell some sort of joke about people who aren't five foot eight, brown hair. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think I told the joke anyway. Um, look, I, red flags. Uh, I don't know. If it's a, I wouldn't call it a red flag, but something to look out for. Uh, make sure the person that you're developing the relationship is actually. You're not going to get a bait and switch. I guess what I would say. You know that uh, there are some there are some firms out there. Uh, prominent firms in the startup tech space where you will meet the partner through a relationship or at an event, you know, through a, through an investor or in an event. Um, and they will sell you on how great they are and how much experience they have working with startup companies, et cetera, et cetera. You will sign the engagement letter and you will never talk to them again because They've got other clients they're servicing and they're going to pass you off to maybe a junior partner, maybe an associate, but by and large, you're not going to talk to them again. That might work in some cases, particularly if you are sophisticated, if you are a repeat player, if you've done this before, um, you may be able to manage that scenario and just say, look, I'll call them when I really need them. But for first time entrepreneurs, um, Oftentimes I find that that can be a problem because you may need a little more, um, pardon the expression, hand-holding when it comes to legal issues, right? Then uh, that, that's going to warrant a partner level attention. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've seen a lot, right? I've got a lot of great people working for me, but they have a lot less experience in this space and they're just not going to identify things. And so if I simply give them the work and back off, something's going to get missed. Right. And that's no knock on them. It's just, there's something to be said for 20 years of experience. So just be careful of that kind of situation. I would watch out for that. And, um, and I think that you, again, referrals are really important references. If you're talking to a lawyer, see if they're willing to give you the names of a couple of other, you know, people they've worked with. Now, they'll give you references to people that they think are going to say nice things about them, right? And they probably will. But they also may be honest with you and say, look, he's a phenomenal lawyer. He's there when we need him. But, you know, the rest of the time I dealt with whoever, right? And if that's okay with you, that's fine. But, but make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, go for it. How's it going? My name's Calvin. Thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering what the process looks like if you feel that your lawyer misrepresented uh, the risks behind certain business decisions. <laughs> Speaking purely hypothetically. Um, <clears throat> that's... 
I guess I'd say that's tricky. I mean, if you're looking for recourse against the lawyer, talk to a malpractice attorney. I, I am not my area of expertise, but that's a hard one because at the end of the day, the risks are oftentimes pretty ephemeral, right? You know, I mean, look, there are situations where it's pretty concrete. Okay. So I'll give you an easy one. Um, if, if you don't pay your employees, like if you have W2 employees and you don't pay them, there are statutory laws in the state of Massachusetts. There, there are statutes in the state of Massachusetts that will make you personally liable for their pay. Right now, I'll also tell you that most startups that I work with violate that law because they almost have to. But you have to understand that risk. That's pretty black and white. If it's more of well, you know, if you put this term in the contract it may work well, you know, it, it won't be that big a deal if we put this term in the contract because, you know, I never see these things, these things end up in a dispute. It's a little harder. So I think it really depends a lot on the circumstances. I, you know, I think how you react, how you, how you deal with it depends a lot on whether or not you think the relationship is repairable. If it's a mistake, if it's something that you think, you know, they made a mistake, but I've got a work, good working relationship. We've been working together for a while. I want to continue working together. I would say you go to the lawyer and you say, look, in all honesty, I think you messed up. And um, I'm upset about it. I'd like to talk about what we can do to basically compensate us for what feels like you know, a significant amount of uh, loss, whatever it is. Uh, if it's not repairable, then I think you find another lawyer. Uh, and then you can dispute the bill on the back end or just not pay it. Oh, I sort of said this a couple times, but uh, law, law firms very rarely chase clients for bills, early stage company clients. They'll chase companies later on, or if you've run up a huge bill, they will start calling you. But they're not going to chase you much for uh, small bills. Um, so you know, there's, there's a fair bit of leverage there. On the flip side, it does mean that I'm not going to have as much leeway to give you runway um, if you're not paying your bills, right? So one tip, and I forgot to mention this while we were still with the, the virtual folks, but um, even if you can't pay the entire bill every month, I recommend you pay some of it. Pay $500. If you get a $5,000 legal bill, pay $500. If you get a $10,000 legal bill, pay $500, right? Because that pattern of payment will demonstrate to the lawyer and to the firm that there is a commitment to the relationship, right? And that will make it much easier when you really need it. When you really need that additional runway, it'll make it easier. Right. Ideally, you pay the bills uh, you know, on an ongoing basis. Certainly, lawyers expect to get paid when there's a financing. If, you, if you've got money coming in from an outside source, the lawyer expects to be paid whatever they're owed. Right? But if there's just routine day-to-day -day work going on for a couple months, and you end up in a situation where one month you can't make the, the payment or all the payment, just pay some. Because right? that will help generate a lot of goodwill. Anybody else? Thank you. There was one a question online that is interesting for me too. So I'm going to uh, give you this one last question. What are the risks of using online legal service in, to incorporate instead of hiring a uh, lawyer firm? Okay, good question. Um, the risk is that it's rarely actually done properly. Uh, here's the problem. <clears throat> There's a difference between incorporating the company and actually organizing the company. Incorporating the company is filing a piece of paper in the state of wherever, Delaware, Massachusetts, wherever you end up filing. Um, that doesn't organize the company. It doesn't set up the board of directors. It doesn't appoint the officers. It doesn't issue the stock. There's paperwork involved in all of that. Now, there are some better services these days that may do that, may, may at least give you the paperwork for that. But... you still have to sign the paperwork. And a lot of times people don't. Um, 
the online services also aren't going to advise you on dealing with issues like, say, splitting equity between founders. Now, if you're solo, if you are purely a solo founder and you want to go to LegalZoom or wherever and form a company, more power to you. Go ahead and do it. I will tell you, I'm going to redo all the paperwork later. Um, I've seen LegalZoom's paperwork. Uh, it's not something I want my early stage companies um, presenting to their investors. But you get a company. You can, you know, you can start, you can open a bank account, you can start doing those basic things. Uh, but if there's two of you or three of you and you are dealing with things like, how do I split equity? You know, how do we deal with, uh, you know, disagreements between those founders? LegalZoom is not going to do that for you. The online services aren't going to provide that service. And honestly, that more than anything else is the value of hiring somebody like me who's done this for a long time. Because the, the paperwork for incorporating a company is easy. I've got forms. Every little law, lawyer that does this work in Boston has forms, right? So that's not the hard part. The hard part is helping you navigate those relationships. And ultimately what it comes down to is just understanding your risk profiles, what your goals are, and helping you translate that into a deal, a business deal. So that's that's the risk of using him. Thank you. Answer. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I, I'm happy to stick around a little longer. I apologize for running a little slow today, um, but uh, I, hope you, I hope it was valuable and uh, look forward to seeing you throughout the week. Thank you.